Gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, for me, it's an honor to be here uh, among uh, some old uh, colleagues and friends and having a chance to uh, meet some new. It is an honor as well to uh, follow Rebecca Johnson. I don't know if she's hearing these words, but uh, she is an international authority and a servant for whom I have the highest respect. Uh, NGOs like hers, like Acronym, uh, do have vital roles to play. Uh, in my experience working with Rebecca and other NGOs over five years, government officials uh, do need informed authorities to consult, and they need informed uh, discourse uh, to consider, and they need good papers to read, and they don't come better than Rebecca Johnson and Acronyms. And I don't need to tell people here that in addition to the help that she gives government officials and many government officials, uh, she is a leader and very influential internationally in civil society and in the formation of public opinion. Uh, as my uh, term as ambassador for disarmament was ending six years ago, John Bolton, you'll remember John Bolton, oh, who before, <laughs> that's a safe target. Uh, <laughs> But before he went out to the UN, he was uh, responsible for, uh, for American uh, uh, not uh, disarmament policy, non-proliferation policy. He was doing his best for George Bush. He was taking multilateral NACD, I'll use that acronym, non-proliferation arms control and disarmament, to save breath. He was taking it down. Uh, he was betraying Ronald Reagan, of course, by trusting no one ever and respecting nothing but the American Constitution explicitly. Uh, but he was doing his damnedest for George Bush. It was a very discouraging time. Uh, Jonathan Shell's description of it in Seventh Decade, which is a book in our company that I would highly recommend, uh, his description of what it was about, a kind of a deluded unipolar moment, uh, and where it all ended up is riveting. But now, six years later, President Obama has committed the United States to a world free of nuclear weapons and to action to that end. It makes a world of difference. American uh, leadership remains crucial in nuclear NACD. Little or nothing can be accomplished without it. These are very dramatic days. I'm finding it hard to keep up. I've been uh, working hard to catch up. We've had to move on from the Cold War, and some, but not all, have. And now we've had to move on from the unilateralism of the Bush administration. Whole big cartons and boxes of well-rehearsed analysis and rhetoric, good zingers and lines, have had to be moved to the attic or to the dustbin. Bush and Cheney and Rumsfeld became such barn doors as targets, uh, they're missed. Uh, and as we and others have had uh, reason lately to learn, it's disconcerting having an adversary collapse. NACD is in the headlines daily. The agenda for the coming year is charged and full, and the stakes are high. To the wealth of analysis and presentation before you and prescription before you, I want to add three points. First. Canada can and should up its NACD game, paying attention at the top, investing talent and effort. Second, the test ban is crucial. In current importance, I think it leaps off the page. Above all, critically, it is a broadly supported, achievable, deliverable, a practical focus for political will and official action. Third, if I have time, because we had talked about Russia earlier, uh, I'll talk about Russia and say that vulnerable and fundamentally defensive, it is not an enemy and poses no strategic threat. There is no need for the vast strategic arsenals created for Cold War deterrence. Residual or manufactured, systematically sustained distrust must not re-rationalize those arsenals. So first, a few words about Canada's role. Perspective in all things. In the world of global strategy and nuclear NACD, 
Notwithstanding the claims in senior briefing books and domestic press releases, Canada is not a key player. We are not a weapon state. We are not a problem. And constrained by NATO's nuclear doctrine, we have never been a new agenda coalition member. We're in the top 20, perhaps. That's a key number, but not the top 10. We can be, though, and we regularly are effectively active, but we must earn influence with ideas and talent. We can't take it for granted. Our government, prime minister, and ministers have not accorded multilateral NACD high priority. And through the Bush years, there arguably wasn't much point in doing so. But that was then, and this is now. And I note, for example, that Canada has yet to respond substantively to Obama's NACD lead. I don't think we've said a word. Nor has NACD been prominent in our public affairs. In recent election campaigns, foreign affairs have gotten very short shrift, and NACD none at all. That may change, though. We're going to be on stage. We're running for the UN Security Council. The election is uh, about a year from now. And we're co-chairing the G20 next spring. People will be paying attention. And the G20 will be like the G8 in the following sense. Its agenda and purpose will grow beyond finance and economics, simply because 20 government leaders gathered together can't ignore the daily news, whether it's economic or political. And Obama has put NACD back on the multilateral agenda. He will need and welcome help, as has been said. He'll need it in NATO. He'll need it in the NPT. He'll need it promoting the test ban and, more generally, in multilateral NACD. And here's an important point. Our bilateral relations, Canada's bilateral relations with the United States, could be enriched with NACD cooperation. It's no secret that it's good for us when we help the United States and the world. It's good for us in Washington. Here's a chance to do so. We need some powerful Americans, perhaps to call some powerful Canadians, to ask for help. I was speculating earlier with Doug Roach about whether Henry Kissinger might call Lawrence Cannon or George Schultz call Peter McKay. We have a strong voice in NATO, and we can help there against predictably hardline opposition from Eastern Europeans to try to confine nuclear weapons to deterring nuclear weapons only, that would be a first step, and to stop conflating all weapons of mass destruction, which means that nuclear weapons are used to deter not only nuclear weapons but other weapons of mass destruction. And he needs help, and we can try to end NATO's first strike posture. I'm happy to note that we are very well represented in this important exercise by Marie Gervais Vidricair, whom many here will know from her work as our ambassador to the IAEA in Vienna. We can help at the NPT review conference as well, and we can help with the CTBT, a subject to which I'll return. I won't rehearse all the ways. They are very well documented in the literature that you have from the Middle Powers Initiative. Obama's Nobel may have been cashed down in advance. He has not saved the world yet, but he sure has changed the world of NACD. He's got it all backwards, in fact. We Canadians have been grinding our gears. We are used to prodding the United States, a nuclear weapon state, to do more, needling that weapon state to honor its commitments. Now Obama's taken the lead. In fact, he's ahead of us in some respects. It was Lee Iacocca, I think, who said that folks should lead, follow, or get out of the way. The truth is, there isn't much for Canada to lead here, and the best thing to do is follow. Follow as well as possible. Help. Form, join, and animate the consensus required for progress. Pay attention at the top. Invest talent. And in the security field, that's cheap. Restore the verification program we used to sustain, for example. Get bright people to work on means to verify compliance, verify the means of a nuclear-free world. But 
Canada can take no great influence for granted. There's a whole world of bright people out there who've been taking all this very seriously all this while, while we've been lax, to say. We have to earn our influence with attention and effort at the top with ideas and talent. Secondly, a few words about the task ban. As I said, I think it's crucial. And don't take my word for it, take Tom Graham's. Uh, the test ban is uniquely mentioned in the NPT's preamble. It was negotiated to permit the indefinite extension of the treaty 15 years ago in 1995. It's the most important of 13 steps in the unequivocal commitment of 2000. It is the litmus test of commitment to Article 6. I don't think the NPT can much longer stand usefully to be without it. I think the CTBT can be brought into force. It has been signed by 180 countries and ratified by 148. And importantly, a cascade of ratifications is credibly imagined. Again, read Tom Graham. I won't recite it. I think that with American leadership, a consensus by momentum can be achieved, like that which took several nuclear weapon states beyond their red lines in the year 2000. Recalcitrant, powerful states can be compelled to join when they would otherwise be exposed as destroyers of a manifest common good, like a test ban in this case. It's the closest thing we've got to a silver bullet, but it's no panacea. Arsenals would remain with careful, costly stockpile stewardship, and those who had tested or who have very big computers are at an advantage. It sure doesn't please everyone, but that's probably a good thing. Still, on examination, it's good for all, with few perceived exceptions. So unnerving, it turns out, are the prospects of the regional nuclear arms racing that testing might trigger. The key thing is that the test ban is a common enough good that even those who don't care to might be obliged to sign on. A consensus by momentum could be achieved. Tom Graham's uh, analysis of a potential cascade of ratifications is to the point. I think it's credible. And another point about the test ban, we don't need perfection. We can have ever fewer tests by ever fewer testers. Meanwhile, by the way, I don't know why the CTBTO's international monitoring system is uh, invisible. Does one Canadian in 10,000 know what it means? And yet it's highly significant. The system is better than anticipated, 10 times better, literally. And national technical means would be better still. The point is that there is no doubt a test ban could be effectively verified. I'm told that American ratification will not be sought before next spring's NPT review conference. The conference will have to do without it. I would think that that makes one of the main goals of the NPT RevCon, meeting in New York, media capital of the United States, to help set the stage for CTBT ratification in Washington. It's true, as has been said, there's plenty on Obama's plate, and ratification won't be easy. 67 votes are required. 40 were obtained last time. A second failed attempt would be highly destructive. Delay might well make strategic sense, and the moratorium needs to hold. But the test ban has always been the next step, and the time is coming for the U.S. Senate to make a momentous decision to take that step and lead the world or not. In sum, I think the test ban should be the focus of intense effort, job one. I will take the time to say a few words about relations with Russia. They, uh, Western relations with Russia, are being reset before our eyes. A lot of bear baiting is abating, and not a moment too soon. Uh, those relations had reached a dangerous pass. What with Dick Cheney in Georgia, you'll recall, on George Bush Avenue, that's what Saakashvili named it, the main street, calling NATO to the Caucasus. NATO blinked. NATO said no. NATO is not a knitting club, nuclear armed for nothing, and Russia knows. 
Americans and Israelis are still training Saakashvili's troops, but at least it's now recognized where it counts that NATO membership for Georgia and Ukraine would serve no one's security interest, and the prospect itself could rip Ukraine apart. It's good that that notion has been shelved without the support of our government. It's good as well that Poland and the Czech Republic will not host U.S. missiles and radars. Whether they worked or not, they would have been an unnecessary and counterproductive provocation. We never accepted the Soviet, Union, uh, Soviet Union's legitimacy. Russia is legitimate. We thought the USSR needed to be contained, an inherently antagonistic attitude which does not apply to Russia. The point is that Russia has legitimate security interests and responsibilities in its many volatile neighborhoods. It will serve them. I should point out as well that not least because Russia is demographically challenged and losing population, Russia will pay very close attention to the treatment of Russian minorities in neighboring countries, and they are significant minorities. In Latvia, they are 40 percent. They're significant in the Baltics. They're very significant in Ukraine and the treatment of those Russians will be reflected in Moscow's attitude towards neighbors. Pavel said this morning that deeper cuts in nuclear arsenals would require less adversarial relations. Toward that end, Western perceptions of Russia are important. And I find Western media portrayals of Russia, such as The Economist, and Canadian coverage, such as McLean's, irresponsibly distorted. Russia goes to hell under Vlad the Terrible, and we're all guilty of appeasement, has been the general line. In those particular words, on the headlines, on the front pages of McLean, Russia has gone to hell under Vlad the Terrible, and we're back to Munich. That is lazy and unconscionably shallow. It gets the direction wrong for a start. Russia's been coming from hell, a fact surely to be welcomed. And by equating Putin with the bloodthirsty totalitarianism of Ivan the Terrible, that coverage insults all at once Vladimir Putin, the Russians who support him, the victims of past totalitarianism, and the intelligence and historical perspective of readers. Read the papers these days. Here's Medvedev yesterday conceding the failings of Russia's state-run corporations and setting the stage for more privatization. Now, the last round of highly uh, uh, privatizations was highly problematic. It gave birth to the oligarchs and a grotesque distribution of income. Good luck this time around. But do note, privatizations are scarcely Putin leading Russia back to the USSR. This is a threatening offense of Russia. This is no such thing. This is a sobered Russia privatizing state assets in the face of the truth, unhidden in Russia for a change, that the system is not working. Whether we ever manage to wish Russians well to do so wholeheartedly, with empathy for what they've been through, and genuine hope that they might fare better this time around, for the good of all concerned, our interest is in Russia's success. We need a competent Russia to run the largest country in the world. We need fear Russian failure not it's still at recovering health and success. Russia has a host of problems, and Putin is not, above all, a Democrat. But tens of millions are living the best Russian lives in history, despite the past year of financial crisis. The record of Russian progress under Putin and Medvedev has been highly impressive. They've led that country from chaos, collapse, and despair, and real trouble in prospect for the neighbors, to stability, recovery, progress, and hope. Beyond its many neighborhoods, uh, to none of which Moscow can ever be indifferent, Russia is obviously vulnerable, necessarily defensive. Slavic stamina will be tested in the Caucasus and in the Far East. Russia poses no strategic threat to anyone. It is indeed a bear. I think that's a very apt symbol. It will defend itself, and it is powerfully equipped to do so, and it will never surrender. Deeply entrenched distrust, angry neighbors and diasporas, and residual mistrust, hostile media portrayals, a yearning need in some quarters for an enemy in Moscow, 
U.S. triumphalism and other factors have soured post-Cold War relations with Russia. Obama's at work resetting those relations, but the point to be noted for our purposes is that residual distrust must not be allowed to re-rationalize massive arsenals on both sides. From our vantage to be noted as well is that a weak Russia, particularly fearful in the Far East, will cling to its nuclear arms. For all that, I'm optimistic. I believe Russia can be accommodated in a world of complementary multipolarity. I'm not sure, though, that Canada will do much about that with Russia so far away, particularly for people in the north who have to fly south before they fly either east or west and then fly north again and so are further away than we in the south are. And particularly with so many politically influential Canadian diasporas deeply, historically, generationally hostile to Russia. Think of all those diasporas who have been here and sustained themselves for good reason, hoping for the freedom of the Baltic states, keeping Ukrainian identity and hopes for independence alive all those years. Uh, there are a dozen diasporas that don't like Moscow, and even the Russian diaspora, which is incoherent and not well uh, collected, uh, is uh, in good part made up of people who left Russia because they didn't want to be there. These are important factors in our relations with Russia. That question of distance and how much it costs to stay in touch with the Russians and how few institutions can afford those costs. And have a look. Diaspora politics are very important in this country, and there's no good politics uh, in promoting a more amicable relations with Russia. In fact, there's often a cost to be paid. Finally, I think one should spare a thought for Moscow's daunting foreign policy agenda. Get on a map and look at the 14 different neighbors that the country has and the difficult regions that it abuts. In fact, I was struck by this fact the other day. Think of this. Uh, when you think of Russia dealing with Central Asia, the Chinese are financing a Russian-language radio station in Kyrgyzstan. Imagine that scene from, uh, from Moscow. Finally, a few words uh, about uh, intangible dimensions, about confidence, uh, about public attitudes and political will. I think Doug Roach is right. I think people have lost confidence in their ability to affect geopolitical security policy. And more generally, I think that we've lost confidence in our ability to contend with nuclear dangers. Nuclear weapons seem like a runaway train. I am an abolitionist. But I see real problems with insisting on and focusing on and centering on zero. Doing so confines support for essential progress, for banning tests, for reforming the fuel cycle, for example, to the insufficient ranks of abolitionists. Again, doing so, focusing on zero, centering on zero, confines support for essential progress to the insufficient ranks of abolitionists. The support who, of many who are unwilling to make that commitment is required. Above all, we need the support of the security and military establishments. And they are not a brick wall of resistance. First, because nuclear weapons cost a bundle and they deplete defense budgets. And second, because soldiers don't want to be murderers. So they don't relish incorrigibly murderous weapons and they know full well that these weapons do not have military use. To be noted as well is that only the strong will disarm first. Nuclear weapons will be forsaken when soldiers tell leaders they don't need them. And I don't mean to be provocative, but think for a moment of the benefits of big conventional bombs. In this context, uh, nuclear abolitionists ought to be pleased that bunkers can be busted without nuclear weapons. You have to imagine a problem presented to a leader uh, who asks what can be done about it, and the answer better not be we can only use a nuclear weapon. They are unusable, but the point is they are rationalized recently as having such uses. Uh, until soldiers can tell leaders nuclear weapons are not required for our security, in fact, we're more secure without them, 
we won't be able to get rid of them. We need the support of military uh, and security leaders and that establishment. We don't know how to get to zero. We don't know how to create a world in which that might be achieved. We're working hard on it, but I don't think political will can be built for something we don't know how to do. The subject is huge and complex. It all makes the head spin, and it can get you down. Politicians need a practical focus. Government leaders, should they agree with your aims and ideals, will ask, yes, I'll help. Now, what specifically do you want me to do that can be done? We do know how to ban tests verifiably. It can be done. And I think political will can be built for doing so. And I don't think anything would do more for confidence and progress than a test ban. I might mention finally uh, that the, uh, the work of Murray Thompson gathering the uh, support of Order of Canada recipients for the convention uh, I think is highly significant and with respect to uh, public opinion and political will, uh, I think that's a huge resource. I think there are people there uh, who have public credibility uh, and I think they should be writing novels and writing poems and making speeches, writing stories about uh, these issues. Uh, and I think that's a huge resource that will be used I in the years to come. Let me end with a final uh, word about hope. Uh, when I was professionally active in this field, I used to quote the great Dutch king, William the Silent, who evidently wasn't entirely uh, so. Uh, but he said that it is not necessary uh, to be hopeful, to persevere. I used to find that uh, liberating, that my duty was not a function of my mood. But it's a tough slog, and uh, thank God for Obama. It is not necessary to be hopeful, to persevere, but it sure helps. Thank you.